Welcome back. Now at the half year mark, Akumba iron ore is plagued by falling prices of the commodity it mines. The miner notes that the CFR benchmark iron ore price has fallen by 26% since the beginning of this year. This is largely due to weak demand from China, coupled with strong global supply. Mining analyst Peter Major joins us now to discuss the dynamics behind the falling price in greater detail and what it suggests for consumers and producers of the metal. Peter, an absolute pleasure. Good afternoon. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sure people have seen enough and heard enough of me in most occasions. So let's try and get to the point here. <laughs> Kumba Iron Ore, like most of our mining companies, is operating under huge constraints. It's had a pretty good environment for a long time as far as high ore, iron ore prices. Kumba's got great ore grade, great deposits, but this is a bulk commodity producer. That means they rely on a lot of outside services that are still controlled by the government, mainly railroad, electricity, and ports. And that's where their largest constraints are. Yes, you've got a falling iron ore price. Um, yes, you've got demand from China reduced a bit, but we're such a small producer compared to the giant producers in the world that we should be able to get through this without any hassle at all. You know, we produce a very high-grade product, but our, our production is down because they can't get the ore without lots of breakdowns, lots of higher costs than normal, getting it to the trains, getting it on the trains, the trains getting to the ports. And then we read about stacker reclaimers at the ports. And the first thing that comes to mind is, why does Transnet... Why do the ports have this huge power? Why don't our iron ore producers, like those over most of the world, especially the big ones, they control the railroads, they control the ports, they own the railroad, they own the ports. Let's make it their responsibility. Government benefits from jobs, from high revenue in dollars, from high employment. You know, government would generate much more credibility, many more jobs, lots more revenue, taking the constraints off these mining companies because there's just too much control, too much legislation, control over the infrastructure and control over what, um, excuse me, Kuma is allowed to do. So when you look at the numbers, you can just see so much is out of their hands that the other iron producers of the world have under their control. It is, of course, uh, one of those periods uh, based on the case that you've made, Peter, here, where it also becomes important uh, for uh, miners uh, like Kumba to be able to control the controllables and, of course, uh, leave the rest uh, to government. I, I do see that they've said they are working with governments to resolve issues out at Transnet. But also just looking at their operations and maybe looking at iron ore around the world. Uh, you know, you said we've got good grades going for us, so we've got great deposits. Is there an oversupply, though, of iron ore around the world, considering also how much China can consume at this time? Well, that is going to come to an end. These fantastic iron ore prices are coming to an end. And, and you're exactly right mentioning about China. China is a first world country now in most respects they tick that box and they've done it more rapidly than any country in the history of the world and to say that they are the largest country in the world and yet they have grown from third world status to first world in literally three three and a half decades it, it's unbelievable what good policy can do and there's a lot of bad parts of china's policy that they probably could have done even better and they, they got rid of some of the bad components of their legislation. But one of the reasons they grew so much, so fast, is they allowed their people and their companies to control their own destiny. They released this claustrophobic, smothering central control that our new government decided to implement three decades ago. So we definitely, we talk about apartheid after World War II turning this country in reverse. But people are going to talk for 100 years how the legislation from 1994, it didn't unleash growth. It didn't unleash wealth in this country. It actually strangled it and drove it out. Uh, and we, we have to give these com companies of ours more flexibility because now the era of higher oil prices is over. 
We see iron ore is averaging now less than $100. It's come down from a high of $200. So the last 20 years, I think, was a commodity boom the world had never seen and will never see again because China has now caught up with the rest of the world as far as industrialization, even exceeded it. So they, they're not growing at 12 13 percent. They're not going to keep using increasing amounts of minerals. Well, with that said, uh, you know, with all the supply that we do have around the world, like you said, Kumba's not the only uh, good producer here. I think BHP recently came out. They've had a bumper period in terms of iron ore. I think uh, Anglos, um, you know, of course, are here we're seeing uh, with a, of, um, a Kumba. It does tell me that at some point, if China is unable to consume all of that, uh, Peter, isn't the market kind of stuck? Are there new markets emerging? Are there uh, countries like China, uh, you know, that are also industrialized and that are also growing, as you say, with good policies that might be able to take up, uh, you know, the, all this iron ore that is in excess in the world? It, there's a lot of hope and expectation that India can fulfill that role. Mm. But India was never quite as constrained as China. So it's not coming off such a low base. And India has been trying to grow like China for many, many decades. And it does in spurts and stops and starts. But this is rare. That's what our government doesn't appreciate. It's rare that one country was endowed with all the minerals we were. It's rare that you have 20 years of super commodity prices, because there are a lot of reasons, you know, you had China growing and much of Asia growing abnormally fast, and now they've caught up with the rest of the world in most respects. So there was a lot of unique occurrences that helped us make all this money from minerals the last 100 years. But instead of saying, hey, this is unique, let's take advantage of it, mm -hmm. we just acted like, oh, this is gonna be how it is forever, and we don't have to do anything about it to help our industry. Well, now it's 30 years too late. Now the patient is old, he's crippled, his intestines are in horrible shape, you know, bad lungs, cancer from smoking. And now we say, oh, maybe we'll tweak our legislation here. Maybe we'll improve our policy a little bit here. We are way past tweaking. We need major surgery. We need a major change in our policy and legislation if we don't want this mining industry to get any smaller than it already has. Oppie, well, it sounds like you've given us lots to think about, so maybe a conversation worth taking forward here when it comes to some of that policy. Uh, we are out of time today. Thank you for your time. Always a pleasure chatting. That was a mining analyst, uh, Peter Major.